All right, welcome to Witch Police Radio. I'm living on the internet, which is where we all live forever, apparently <laughs> because this pandemic doesn't seem to be going anywhere. But uh, I have a guest on the show who is new to the podcast, but definitely not new to the local music scene. Uh, so I think the best way to start this off is if you want to introduce yourself and maybe just give a bit of background about what it is you do musically, and we can take it from there. Sure, yeah, I'm a piano player, mostly jazz, I would say, but I play lots of different stuff. Um, I've, I've been playing since I was a little kid, um, probably... 30 years at this point. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and I grew up in Winnipeg, grew up in, in the Wolseley area and uh, really got into music when I was like 11 <laughs> and basically have been going hard ever since then, just, you know, practicing, well, and making music. Yeah. What was the appeal of jazz for you? Like, how, how did you get into that? Because, you know, I'm also from Wolseley and I definitely got into music oh, yeah. at a young age too, but jazz was something I, I discovered, I guess, as a listener, like, you know, when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, it wasn't something that had really uh, appealed to me. So what, what, what drew you in uh, to jazz well, when you were younger? I mean, it was just the improvisation. You know, it was like, I, I was playing a lot of, I was a trained, you know, classically got a lot of lessons and, and I liked that and I still enjoy that playing written music. But yeah, as soon as I, I discovered that you could just make stuff up, which really should be a part of classical piano too, but totally, yeah, it's not usually, but yeah, I just, I, I really like that. And also the, the more communal aspect of it, like being able to like, just get together with someone and like jam as opposed to like having to formally, you know, learn music and, and all that. So yeah, it was just, it was really just more fun. And uh, I also started getting gigs when I was like pretty young. So I started making some money. So that helps. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a motivator too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and I know you have, uh, I think it's three now uh, records though, right? But you, but you played with so many other people. What was kind of your, I guess, trajectory to getting to the point we are now? Like, are there some sort of key people that you played with, um, whether it was as, you know, uh, backing them up or, or in a group with them that sort of led you towards the path that you've uh, taken? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things for me was as soon as I graduated high school, I went on tour with Maynard Ferguson, okay. who was a pretty well-known trumpet player a few decades ago anyways. Um, and I was lucky enough to be recommended by my teacher who was in his band before me. And uh, he hooked me up and I, I went on this world tour and, you know, with a bunch of like middle-aged guys. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was really, yeah, that was probably like five years of learning experience in one year. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that was one of the, the biggest kind of accelerating factors. And then just aside from that, just, just like hanging out a lot in New York city whenever I can and traveling and just being around musicians in bigger cities is, is really helpful too. Right, just so, so kind of soaking in that experience for, from some of those hubs, I guess, for, for jazz and yeah, for music in and general. Just, and just being around other musicians in a, that, that are at a really high level. That's, it's something that's kind of, I mean, there's great musicians here. There's just not a lot of musicians. Sure. Here, so it's good to be around just a, a huge number of amazing musicians. Well, just to jump back to something you said a, few, a minute or two ago about, about getting interested in the improvisation part of it and then the idea that you could just make things up one thing that i found interesting and this is from my own experience playing in definitely not jazz bands but playing in punk bands and then whatever else over yeah. the years is that i know a lot of people who are, are amazingly well trained at music they can play written music just beautifully and flawlessly but they often have a difficulty with that improv part of it because it's not in front of them on the page so i guess i don't know if that's just a, a kind of a casualty of being so trained that that aspect of it doesn't come like how did you kind of break through that well, as I said before, like, I don't think that should be the case. Like, right. if, you yeah, look, no, yeah. if, if you look back actually like a long time ago, even in like classical music, there used to be a lot of improvisation. And I don't know, at some point, music education kind of shifted away from that. And I think that's more a fault of like how we teach people how to play music versus like the actual style. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not something a lot of kids do at a young age they if, if they are lucky enough to have you know like more musical uh exposure at a young age um maybe that's changing i mean i'm not involved in early education right so right know. but like i'm just saying like that's my experience um so where was i going with that um <laughs> yeah i just just like it, it's kind of a thing you you it feels weird at first you know you just have yeah. to start you just have to take like a, a scale or like a series of chords and just 
like mess around with them and sound terrible. And you, you may be able to play, you know, amazing stuff that's you've figured out in advance and then you go to mix, make it up and you don't sound good. And so right. it's like, you have to just kind of jump in there and just be okay with that for a while until you get used to it. That, that makes yeah. a lot of sense actually for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I do have some more questions that relate to that, but uh, I yeah. wanted to get into your into your latest record, which I guess came out uh, back in the fall, right, of last year. Yeah, November of 2020. Yeah. Okay. So what's the what's the backstory behind that? I guess that's your first one in a few years now, right? Yeah, I think the last one was in 2016. So it's, it was about a five year gap. I yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of backstory aside from uh, it was kind of just I wanted to make a new one because it had been a while. And also I was, I was just around some great musicians that I hadn't recorded with before. Okay. And it, it's kind of a, it was, I just wanted to kind of establish a new era of, I don't know, these musicians I really like playing with and I wanted to document that. So that's, that's it really. Okay. How long was that yeah. one in the works? Like did, did the pandemic come into play at all during no. the creation of that record? No, it was, it was all recorded uh, well before any of that okay well not okay. well actually no you know what not well a few months before a few months before so no it didn't play into it at all it ended up like kind of being a theme in part in terms of like what i ended up titling some of the tunes and stuff like that oh really okay okay a little bit but it was it didn't really play into it all that much yeah it, it played into releasing it a little bit because yeah you know, i was planning to tour and do all that stuff but you know that's that's happened to everyone so. well i think i think that the last time i saw you play live would have been at the uh the red house show that you did with uh with jocelyn gould yeah. did you get many shows after that or was that sort of uh near the end of the that actively was, playing thing before the was, pandemic kicked that in? was one of the last shows that might have been i might have done one or two things out like outdoor things after that and aside from that i've played at like one birthday party and that's okay. it <laughs> So what yeah. has that experience been like? Because obviously you've been playing, like you said, you, you've been playing music live for since you were a teenager, you know, yeah. uh, obviously quite heavily. So what yeah. has that experience been like where you literally can't do any of the traditional type of shows you would have done uh, even a year before or two, two years before? It was rough for a while. I guess we're all kind of numb to it at this point. Sure. It's just, it's just kind of like, all right, whatever. But yeah, it sucks. I mean, I've, like everyone else, I've learned a lot more about, uh, expressing myself through the internet <laughs> yeah we have to right yeah yeah so i mean i've kind of been i've i'm i like using computers and like nerding out by myself you know so i mean i'm i'm actually kind of okay with a lot of aspects of it but i, I really do want to be back playing music in a in front of an audience again because there's just it's playing on in front of a video camera is just not not great really yeah, you don't get the same kind of feedback from the audience. Even it's if you do get feedback, yeah. it's different, right? Like, it's okay if that's one of many things you're doing. But if it's the only thing you're doing, it, it just gets kind of demoralizing after a while. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that I think that I think everyone probably agrees with that for sure. Yeah. So um, on on the record, I mean, you know, there's 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 originals, there's there's covers, there's traditional uh, songs, but the uh, the Smashing Pumpkins cover was the one that stuck out the most for me, just because I, I I was listening and I didn't actually look at the song titles first, and all of a sudden that came on, and it was like, oh, this is Blue Butterfly Wings. <laughs> did so you, did you rec did you recognize the song like without like looking at the title? Yes, but it took it yeah. took, it took me about a yeah. minute though, and I was like, "This is really." And then it dawned on me what it was, and, right. and so I guess uh, like I, I really like what you did with it, and I think that kind of goes with what you're saying earlier about uh, you know improvising and doing things that maybe aren't don't sound the way that you they're expected to sound because that's clearly yeah. what you're doing with that song. Yeah. But how do you take something like that and turn it into what you did? Like, what's the how do you deconstruct it and then play it in your style? Because even just translating it from a, a rock band to piano it right. alone is very different and let alone you know turning into a jazz piece yeah uh, that's 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 kind of a hard question to answer sure it's, it's like a little bit mysterious in a sense because to, to some extent I, I guess here's how i would explain it like you learn all this all these devices for like arranging music and say taking a series of chords and changing them into a different series of chords that also work with the melody that's called reharmonizing. Okay. So, so you like, basically that's what that is. It's a reharmonization of the tune. Like I kept the melody. If you may have noticed, like basically exactly 
intact. Like yeah, the vocal line is there and everything. Yeah, yeah. I changed it a little bit. Like I changed the time signature um, for part of it, but like I kept the melody basically like it is, and I changed the underlying harmony. So when you're learning how to do that, you know, you kind of learn all these like theoretical devices you can use, like just different different things you can do with harmony. Okay. But when when you actually go when I actually go to do that for something I might actually want to perform. I'm not really thinking theoretically anymore. That's more just like the training. Okay, okay. And I'm really just sitting at the piano and like coming up with sounds that I like. Like, okay, here's the melody. What chords would sound good under it? I mean, okay. it's, it, you really do, you, you have to do enough like kind of groundwork that that like that's not gonna work until you've done the, the kind of groundwork. And then it's just by feel after that? But then it's, yeah, it's, it's more or less by feel. Like I'm rarely sitting there like, you know, I'm going to use a tritone substitution here or something. Like I don't, you know, I try not to really think that way. I try to go right. by feel. Yeah. Why, why that song? And again, I really like what you did with it, but what was the, uh, what about that song spoke to you as something to put on the record? I mean, it's like a classic song from my youth. Sure. So yeah, like, yeah. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I like I just like doing songs like that. I mean, jazz musicians can get really into these like standards that are like a hundred years old at this point. And it's the same um, ones over and over again, right? Yeah, but there's always been a tradition in jazz of like some people are always actually doing like more contemporary. Not that that's even contemporary anymore, <laughs> but like closer to being contemporary. Sure. And you know, there's there's people always that are doing newer stuff. Like jazz musicians have always done covers and arranged them. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. And you know a lot of them just stick to like jazz standards, but, but a lot of other people do those kinds of tunes because they, they can work really well. It just depends on the tune. Also yeah. like, it depends on the melody, I think. There's some melodies that just lend themselves more to, you know, morphing it into this style than others. Okay. So you kind of have to mess around. Like I've, I tried a bunch of other songs. I don't really even remember what they were anymore, but they were just, they just didn't end up working. And that one ended up working. Okay. Yeah. Is, is that a song that works better um, when you have a band with you as well? Because I mean, the drums on that are very, uh, oh, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. prominent. And, and I mean, I, I imagine it would sound very different just you on the piano solo, right? It's almost like I wouldn't even want to play it without drums. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't work at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the drums are like, 80 percent of that song <laughs> sure yeah 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 and i think that's definitely the most uh, uh to my ears anyway the most rock not that it's a rock yeah. song but it's the heaviest song right uh, uh of the record. Basic, it's basically like math rock jazz yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> do you do you listen to any of that kind of stuff like that that kind of jazz influenced heavier music um honestly not not really like like not really okay okay if, if you name if you could name some people and I well might, i was just I, thinking there's the kind of these like weird subgenres of of uh like metal that have basically have uh you know yeah, yeah, yeah. bigger you know kind of experimental parts and yeah I, I haven't really checked out a lot but i i would yeah, yeah for <laughs> it, sure, it yeah. appeals to me i just it's not something i've explored a lot personally yeah yeah what is um what's the reception to that, that song been i mean because that's something that even a non-jazz listener is going to recognize and yeah. it, it's going to speak to them you know if, especially if they grew up with it Right. In that yeah, era, it's right? funny. Like every, every song has different people that respond to it, basically, sure. like different demographics of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that one has been yeah, a lot. A lot of people who, like you said, are not necessarily like like, I don't know what it, whatever you want to call it, like traditional jazz fans or like the Yeah, they're coming from other genres, maybe, but they appreciate like musical complexity or something yeah. so yeah yeah well, well yeah. maybe that brings in a question of, of like and i think this is probably hard for a lot of jazz artists to answer um because i've had some on the show and they've had this, this same trouble with it but what is who, who who's your audience because i think there's a stereotype that the jazz is geared towards older people i don't think that's fair but there's definitely yeah. that's the uh kind of um perception a lot of people have is that this is music for you know Right. whatever age and up right and they, clearly you're doing something like that and other things that are stylistically more appealing to to a younger and right. your own age group right yeah that's that's like i think about that a lot and like i don't want it to be like all 70 year olds listening to my music yeah i mean i would say like older people tend to like like older jazz fans this is a huge stereotype but they tend to like more like 
straight ahead, like traditional jazz standard, like, I don't know, Oscar Peterson, okay. like very straight ahead swinging jazz, I guess. That's a huge like generalization. Yeah. But like maybe younger people, sometimes it appeals more to them if it's more experimental actually. And like, it doesn't sound like, I don't know, what pe whatever people think of when they think of jazz, they don't necessarily want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that was, so. I mean, that was me personally too, before I really started listening to jazz in any kind of significant way, I had this perception of what it was, which is, you know, that perception that it was like, oh, this isn't something I'm going to like because right. I perceive well, the audience as 108 and up, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, jazz is such a massive genre like yeah it's it's not even a genre really it's just like what it's an umbrella right there's so many different <laughs> subgenres underneath it yeah so many subgenres that like it's hard to even i don't know like I, I i know in my head what like straight ahead mainstream jazz is but there's i don't know there's so many different ways to do it <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like it, it becomes so vague like is this jazz anymore i don't know <laughs> so yeah so how, how does that work in a city like Winnipeg then when, you know, like there, there is a, there's definitely a jazz scene here, but it's not, it's not huge. And it, mm -hmm. does it make it difficult to sort of, uh, for shows to be booked and things where, you know, someone is booking a show, they want some jazz artists, they could have you and they could have someone doing something completely different that still kind of qualifies as jazz and maybe it doesn't mesh well. Like, is there, is it, is it hard to find, I guess, uh, people with the, the same spirit, I guess, uh, when it comes to making music in a city like Winnipeg? Right. I mean, I would say, Aside from jazz Winnipeg, there's not, not a whole lot of people going out there booking I, I guess, jazz. I know? guess it's not a jazz club or anything. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, good point. Good so point. so yeah. it's, it's more like you got to hustle your own stuff or potentially like book a venue yourself and, and pay for it yourself. Yeah. Or, or do, you know, find gigs like for other functions and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Is that primarily what you've been doing, though, as far as getting gigs locally, just just hustling and finding kind of alternate ways to, to to find shows? Yeah, somewhere like Winnipeg, it's it's too small to like, I, I can't go out there and just perform creative, original jazz for a living. You know, right. it's too small. It's too small for that. Um, so, yeah, you've, I, I've always been all about just trying to be like as diverse of a musician as possible or as malleable to whatever situation like not not as much now as I used to because I have you know I teach a lot and I have other ways of you know making a living but yeah when I when I was a, I was a freelancer for like I don't know 10 years and I would just take any gig and if I didn't yeah. know what I was doing with the gig I would just figure out how to like sound passable okay you know? okay so yeah, I I've always been big on that. Yeah. And is that with just whatever genre of music someone needs yep. a piano player? Yes. Someone called me for like, you know, a salsa gig and I would learn how to play salsa. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the classical training really helped because I could also do some classical gigs. Sure. And my reading, my sight reading is really good. So like anything that involved reading was like fine. Like I did some, some music, like some rainbow stage gigs. I did some just like rock band or like whatever other like other genres just yeah you know i just anything i would i would take any gig and just figure it out <laughs> well and I guess, I guess all the years of doing that probably helps you just towards your own music anyway because you've had the opportunity to perform all these different styles totally. yeah even yeah. if it's not what you're into right because some of it could seep into to influence yeah. things yeah. and you see how it works you see how it works differently every genre has its own kind of subculture yeah. And I, you know, I'm not saying I know all about every subculture, but I got little glimpses into, you know, a bunch of different musical worlds, which is really cool. Do you think that there's a way that jazz can be not uh, sold is the wrong word, but uh, presented to younger people in a way to get them into it? Because I think there's a lot of people who would enjoy it if they, again, got past that stereotype of it, you know, this is my granddad's music or whatever, right? Like, right, I mean, right, right. Because I know a lot of people who, you know, played very different kinds of music and have kind of had the same realizations I did as an adult and saying, that wait, I love this. <laughs> There's so much cool stuff that I didn't even know about and I neglected for so long. Like, what do you think might be the, a good way to sort of break past that for just the mainstream listeners? Yeah, I guess I guess that's kind of like a, just a. Oh, that's really hard to answer. Well, I guess if, if you I, had the answer, you'd if, be if doing I knew it. Right? That, I would be I would be more famous than I am. But. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> 
Um, I, I mean, I think just, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you stumped me there. Well, I mean, there may I, not, there may not be an answer. I think that the fact that no one's figured out how to do it yet is maybe indicative that there isn't actually an answer I don't, to my question. I don't, know, I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to think about it. It's okay. more like okay. it's, it's, well, I don't know, a right or I don't, maybe, maybe the way to think about it is like, you've got to make like, whatever music you're making just has to be the music you believe in. Right. right. Like I'm not going to necessarily, I'm not going to make music deliberately because I want a 20 year old to like my music, you know? Like, oh, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I can still kind of like market it in a certain way, I guess. Like I can, I can talk about it in a way that might speak to someone that's younger as opposed to like, like, I don't like having it, have this vibe where it's like gated and it's like yeah. elite you know that just really annoys me <laughs> like i don't i don't want to appeal only to seven year olds yeah of course yeah like yeah. i want i want to appeal to any age really so yeah i don't know i mean i i don't know if you can like say i'm going to make this music appeal to this age group well you can't force it right you can't that, that'll, it. that'll fail yeah, yeah, more yeah. than yeah yeah that'll be because that could be so brutal if you're like <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make some cool music that the kids are gonna like yeah that's and then it's yeah. gonna it's gonna not be good <laughs> no no it's not no well and i guess the other thing too is like I, i've kind of realized this um recently is that there's a lot of, i mean i'm almost 40 and there's music that pe i have people on the show sometimes who are 18 or 20 or whatever and the stuff they're making a lot of the time it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever but then I, it kind of occurred to me that it's not for me like i'm not the audience for right. that stuff so and if right. they were making it and if i liked it they're probably doing it wrong so i guess yeah. there's that that element of it too it's like you can't you don't want to talk down to someone by trying to ape their style in an attempt to get them to like what you're doing right so yeah you're, you're right yeah i think you just have to be just genuine about your music and i don't know if, if they're gonna i hope that they end up liking it and what am i gonna do i mean i look at my <laughs> like you know data of who's listening and it's it's pretty it's pretty all over the place. Like maybe skews a bit older, but it's not like only people over 60. Like it's, yeah. you know, like on Spotify, it's like 30 year olds and 40 year olds a lot of the time. So. Well, know. that may maybe is another question that relates to this. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but um, I, I have this perception and I, I, I could be completely wrong that jazz is a genre, uh, country is another one where CDs are still a very big part of the business rather than streaming. Streaming obviously exists in a large way with everything, but do you find that, you know, uh, platforms like Spotify and all that are, are working well for you and you're getting, uh, reaching people and getting listeners, or is it still very heavily buying a CD at a show kind of, uh, kind of, well, it would be buying a CD that shows. If shows happen. Yeah. I, I still think that's important. Like the way to look at CDs now in 2021 it's not that like even the older people are not actually listening to your CD on yeah. a CD. Well, I, I, mean, I still do, but I'm, uh, that's unusual. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. but that's, yeah. that's like 1% of... I know, I know, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but people still buy CDs because they want to support you. It's like, it's almost like a merch product at this point. Totally. It's like having, it's like having a t-shirt, you know? And, yeah. and so, you know, it's easier to sell those at shows. You can still sell them online to some extent. Um, so that's, that's how I look at CDs. Um, but Spotify has been working fine for me. I, it's, I've it's, done, good. it's good. Yeah. I've, I've done or been doing really well on there. <laughs> so maybe I got a bit lucky, but you know, it's been, it's certainly not like paying the bills, but. Yeah. I think, I think there's yeah. a very small number of people that that actually happens for just because of how little they pay artists. Right. But, but yeah, I, th I think for a jazz musician, like I have a lot of streams on there. Compared that's cool with, that's compared with most people so it's good to hear yeah obviously yeah. what you're doing is clicking with with listeners the problem with spotify and, and other streaming is that it's almost impossible to like actually reach out to your audience like it's just a black hole of like yeah. there's all these people listening to it but i have no idea who they are and i have no way of like reaching out to them so it's pretty brutal in that sense that's that's one thing people don't people always talk about like the cost per stream, which sucks. Yeah. But I think for me, the bigger problem is like, if you're on Facebook or Instagram and someone checks out your music, they can DM you or you can, sure. you can talk, you, you can talk to them. But on Spotify, you just have no idea who they are. It's just so, numbers. 
and and the chances of them like listening to you and then like looking you up on another platform is like pretty low yeah so to me yeah. that's the that's the more brutal part about it but anyways, I think that, get, that, that gets overlooked though I think I think a lot of people just focus solely on the low amount of pay and then just yeah uh, I mean I would, take, I would take even lower stream numbers if it was like more of a social media platform where people could comment on your music and then you could like you know engage with them and that kind of stuff yeah but I don't know well what's uh, I guess what's your preferred way of people purchasing your music I, I'm guessing CDs is probably still a big one because well, you get the money that's, off that that's by a huge percent is like the highest profit margin yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah i mean if you want to order the cd it's a beautiful cd like the the cover art is beautiful and i'll sign it and you know i'm, I'm always happy if people order a cd yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> well what's the best way i guess to find out about what you're up to then because uh, i mean if people want to order a cd or, or other merch yeah. or, or listen to your music where's kind of the main place they should go online to, to find you yeah you can just go literally any platform slash will bonus okay that's so pretty like, straightforward I, that's my username on everything so okay or just my website willbonus.com so okay if you know my name you can find me anywhere <laughs> right right <laughs> and then they can order cds and are, are your older albums still floating around out there or are they just oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. yeah they're still there I, I still have i still have inventory <laughs> nice well yeah it's, i think that everyone kind of gets stuck with the uh, boxes of, of cds <laughs> yeah. at some point or another right so that's cool yeah yeah and then uh, obviously no one knows when the pandemic's gonna end i mean it could yeah. be could be next month it could be two years from now hopefully not but right oh, it's, it's, it's all up in the air so <laughs> what's kind of your plan once things do change assuming they do do you have an idea of what you want to do sort of right away once uh it goes back to some semblance of normal yeah i want to start booking some tours it's my hope like as as the problem is like you kind of have to wait till it's over and then you have to book a tour about a year in advance. So, yeah. So, you know, we're looking at probably two years till I actually am on tour, but that's what I want to be doing. So, I mean, and then obviously just performing locally again. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you and think then, you'll be recording anything else uh, over that time? Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple plans. Um, one thing I'd like to do is a solo piano record, which I've never done. I've played a lot of solo, but I've never done a record. Okay. And uh, cause that's obviously I can do that whenever you don't have to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very pandemic proof. Um, and then I, I, I'm leaning towards maybe a trio record, piano trio record. Um, but that's, that's about it. I, I don't really have a timeline, but I'm hoping to get both of those recorded within the next year. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's my plan. Cool.